As dads, one of the staple songs is The Cats in the Cradle from 1974. The song still holds true today. It's a heartbreaking song that tells about a son and father who can't get their times to schedule right because they're always busy. Today, we have John Knight joining us who got a second chance to not end up like the song, The Cats in the Cradle. And so we're going to talk to him about prioritizing family and how does it feel to have sons that are 23 years apart. Let's get into the show. Welcome, daddy to the Indie Dads Podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Reese, a dad who's trying just like you. And this show is dedicated to the joys and challenges of fatherhood in Indiana and beyond. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the Indie Dads Podcast. Because when it comes to being a dad, we're all in this together. All right, Daddy O's special conversation today with John Knight. By day, he is the computer guy. By night, he is a bookend dad, meaning he is a father of two generations. His oldest is 25 and his youngest is two. There's a lot going on there. So we're going to jump right in and get into it. John, thank you for being here today. We always like to start out with kind of going into your background of how you became a dad. Well, first of all, let me start. I'm one of these guys, as long as I can remember, I always wanted to be a dad. I love being a father. I love the idea of being a father. And I married my high school sweetheart year after I graduated college. A white picket fence in this case. I think it was a cedar fence, but we had our, my first son was born a year after we got married. His name is Thomas. He's now 25, married and closed out his first mortgage in <laughs> January. So he's in the mortgage club, like, the, like, it's like some of us. And my youngest, I got remarried a little over seven years ago. And my youngest is two, just turned two <laughs> at the end of December. So I, I, as I've said before to some other folks, I book in dad or whatever, I'm an older dad. I had my first in my mid twenties and I'm now 51. So I have some experience being a father, but, uh, it's a different perspective more than being an expert. I'll put it that way. Really? You're almost like going through two generations of raising kids. Yeah. That is, oh yeah, that's, that, that is the best way of putting it. And it's something that. Well, hey, look, anyone listening who's a dad, currently a currently a dad, knows that there's a whole lot that you, that you cannot get out of a book until you are a father. You just don't know, right? Until you know, you don't experience it. Well, this is kind of the same way. It's like having multiple kids, right? You don't know what like having more than one kid's like until you have more than one kids. But this is something like I'll give you for instance. I'm I'm, I'm my background is technology. I've been a peer programmer, software architect for pretty much my entire career. I've you know been on on keyboard since I was like ten years old. And so technology, yeah, I'm, I'm computer savvy. I'm sure it's my job, but having two kids that span that many years, you know, like my oldest didn't have a cell phone until teenage years, didn't quite grow up with screen like my two year old is right now, like iPad, one of his first words, literally, you know, <laughs> and the kid is as amazing as just, you know, so yeah, it, it is, it's very much about growing up in two different generations and it's, it's both terrifying incredibly fascinating and entertaining at the same time. So yeah, so I'm good at dad, right? <laughs> so in the thick of things still, but yeah. what would you say the difference is between raising your first about 20 years ago and then <laughs> raising, raising a new toddler now? So a couple of things. One, the sleep deprivation did not get any easier. <laughs> Number one, I'll put it that way. Yeah. Number two, and I think I'm going to be general because again, you know, I, I've only had this experience of this many years between the two. Having the second one, I'm, I'm way more relaxed at, way more relaxed. I was, oh, I can't remember, you know, a given movie, but, you know, they literally looking at the child in the middle of the night, making sure they're breathing. That was me. That was legitimately me. This time around, no, 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 no. I'm not scooping him up every time he starts to stumble or whatever. You know, uh, today was, for example, today was at preschool and the, the folks, the beautiful job of sending him a picture and lots of others, ends the report. He fell and got a little scrape on his chin. Like, yep. That was, it was like, yep. 
Buzz just Jen. It happens, right? Uh, younger me would have been in a tizzy thinking about it all day until I was able to pick that kid up. So that's one thing. The second thing is, is just, I think, and again, it's just being older and it's been years, I don't know, but looking at the world a little differently, you know, again, being older, I'm, I consider myself an optimist in a lot of ways. And so, you know, bringing a kid into the world, I think it's a good thing. I think it's, it's a fantastic thing to do. And yes, every, every, every age, every century has its challenges and, you know, and, and, and threats, if you will. But I think bringing the second one into this world, I'm even more optimistic. I know it sounds horrible. We are coming out of a pandemic and everything, you know, are still coming out of the pandemic. I'm a little bit more optimistic about what this kid's future is going to be like. I know we're, you know, economic situation, inflation, everything else, but I just look and I believe that, you know, these kids are our future. And I look at some of these beautiful children, his friends in this little preschool class. And, you know, it's like, man, that's where it's at. Right. You know, that's, that's what's coming up. And so I'm, I'm very, very happy about that. So those are, those are the things that come to mind. Awesome. It, like how do, I don't even know if you actually know the answer to this, but is, is your oldest, does he feel more like an uncle or a dad or just, um, just a relative or what? Wow. You know, I just, I would say just, I mean, it'd be fair, just around him. He, and I mean, he lives in Michigan with his wife and has his own life. And boy, that's another, that's a, we can get in Cat, uh, Cat Stevens, uh, you know, uh, Cat in the Cradle. Uh, yeah. And, 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 well, that's a whole other, other whole other theme. But no, they're, they're not close to anything. He, I think, does feels connection, but it's just not part of his, his daily life, you know? And, and, I, and it's fine. I get it, you know? So I don't have any, you yeah. know, heart feelings or whatever. I, I think he, he wants to be, again, just timing right now. He's a toddler. Yeah. You know, and we don't travel as, as again, we're not up there every weekend or whatever. I've actually got uh, older parents and I'm you know, helping to take care of them along with my brother. So it's just that moment in life, you know, where, you know, things are settled, not that they ever are perfectly settled, but so he doesn't have as much time maybe to visit his younger brother. Yeah. 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 But, but, you know, we're still a family, you know, it's, it, it's yeah. we're still a family. And, and again, I think I, I will say this, and this is a segue to a <laughs> different topic. So when, how can I put this? It was after my youngest, his name is Wyatt, was born. And he, you know, my, my oldest is talking to me and we're just on the phone, just talking about whatever we were talking about. He changed the subject and he goes, I'm just going to say this. Because I don't think we brought it up before. But me and my wife, we wanted to let you know, we want to have kids. I, I held my breath. I didn't say a word for like a minute until he goes, are you there? I'm like, yeah. I go, I'm just being respectful. I'm not saying anything. I said, is that it? Is all you want to say? He goes, yeah. I'm like, okay. I'm, I don't want to be that dad. I'm not going to be, you know, pressuring you to have kids or whatever. And I will, can't wait to have grandkids. But, you know, right now, everything's good. He goes, okay. Like, he goes, we're not trying. I'm like, I didn't ask anything. <laughs> don't ship anything you don't want to share. And so finally, you know, we kind of kind of laughed, kind of laughed out the, you know, the rest of the conversation that way. But the reason I bring that up is, you know, there was this moment when I'm laughing myself, it was like, the clock's ticking. Am I going to be a grandfather or a father first? Because I didn't know if they were trying or not or whatever. And so right now, as far as I know, I know grandkids on the way, but there will be eventually. And I'm very happy about that. But then that's another dynamic, right? When yep. that's going to happen. And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to all of it. I really am. So yeah, it's all, it's all family. That's the, that's what's yeah, important. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What's been the biggest surprise for you in fatherhood other than you know, having oh, the new man. one? <laughs> Wow. Yeah. That's a big one. You know, I, I, I have to go with probably one of the class. So that is that moment. And I think every dad knows, you know, when it was when they realized, oh, I'm a dad. I, I, I'm really a dad. Like that, that moment, that light switch moment, right? To me, that still goes back is that when you literally look at the world completely different part of it's, you know, a selflessness that comes, I you know, for me, it was part of, you know, it's not all about me anymore. The two, you look around the world and the, the dangers and the threats and the, the rocks and everything's a threat, you know, to your, your future child, you know, or your newborn child in my case. So yeah, I think that was still the biggest one. I think maybe a second, a follow up to that one is I love the small moments and that's think, being an older second dad. I love, I love to cherish the small moments. When I was younger and I had my oldest, I was, this is the nineties. I was in dot coms. I was working seven days a week. I was, you know, do, doing the thing. And I missed out a lot of time when he was really, really young. And now I'm absolutely, every day is one, you know, they're always small kids for a certain amount of time. You know, those, those free hugs that you get, you know, joyous, you know, unsponsored, unsolicited, 
hugs are, you know, they're, they're limited time offer. Right. And so eventually they'll, they'll slow down, you know, but yeah, right now I, I'm just loving the small moments. Just the smiles when he's running into preschool, just the, again, it's just the little things right now, but those are so, so very good important to me right now. Yeah. And seeing them accomplish like steps or like, oh yeah, where, where they go, like first words, walking, all that stuff. It's just amazing oh. to see. And oh, even yeah. like when they start to ask you questions that you wouldn't even expect. <laughs> that's oh, when those absolutely. Are great. Oh, and right now he is, is the person now. That's the other thing. I, and this is what I watched with the oldest and now even the youngest. It's just to watch the personality come out. And when you start hearing, he's putting like, he's just literally two months or two, two years and three months. Right. He just, just turned that he's putting words together. So blue car or your mom's blue car. And to hear that voice, right? That's that, that voice that's going to develop, mm -hmm. that'll, you know, through puberty will change, become the, you can start to hear that voice. that's going to be his voice for the rest of his life and the personality. And one of those things that's just, again, every kid's different. My youngest, let me give you a highlight. Yeah, my youngest, I got a uh, little uh, stuffed cocker spaniel floppy dog when he was born from one of his aunts, it, he named it Sparky. And Sparky went on thousands of miles of road trips, including, you know, having to turn around one state line over to go back and get Sparky at a rest, rest stop or restaurant. One of those, right, right now, my youngest is taking a little metal police car to pet right now with him in the preschool. Police car is the center of his universe. And it's so different and so adorable. So him, uh, he loves anything with four wheels, just absolutely loves four wheel vehicles right now. So again, just those differences and just appreciating those things and just watching be, become him is just, it's fantastic. Well, yeah, enjoy. That's yeah. That's awesome. So you kind of mentioned your career and how it's kind of maybe changed a little bit. How, how has the career kind of affected like your fatherhood? Oh man, that's a, that's a, well, that's a big one. I would say, well, let me, let me, let me, let me take you back a little bit of time. How, how my father's career influenced me and then what actually happened right you know the, i'm never gonna do that or i'm not gonna be that kind of dad my dad was a and i, you know, I have you know an adult's perspective on this my dad was very hardworking, now retired still with us god bless him a hard-working man worked his way up uh, from literally coal mines up to the executive offices very very proud and very honored to be his son but from a child's perspective he was not home as much as other dads were that i saw Right. So I said, I don't want to be that kind of dad. I want to be home. And so when my oldest was born, I wanted to be that kind of dad. And one of the first things I did, of course, was, oh, opportunity knocked on the door and I, the family to Texas from Indiana for a few years, startup company, moving back to another startup company. And I was guilty as sin for doing what I thought I would never, you know, what I said I would never do. And eventually I made decisions. There was a divorce from my first wife. And that was really probably the, the biggest moment where I said, I'm going to make sac real sacrifices in terms of my career and where I could go to actually be a father and to make sure I have that time there. And so I worked for a Fortune 500 company and I had opportunities to go back, get an MBA on their dime. I turned that down. I worked less hours. And I was a dad, I was a single dad for, for a number of years and I focused on that, you know, through it. And so that was a huge impact. And again, I don't, I don't have any regrets through that. I mean, I have, there are pangs and I, I'm, I'm, I'm human, you know, I look and go, you know, think about what could have been, but in the reality of things, I wouldn't change anything. I would give it a chance, you know, uh, three wishes or whatnot. I wouldn't go back and change anything. And so coming into father the second time, what I'm doing differently is yeah, I'm, I'm not working the crazy hours I once did. I'm not looking for opportunities like that. I like spending time with my wife. I like spending time with my kid. I am able to, you know, pay the rent as it were. But even while I'm home, more importantly, even the time while I'm here, I'm way more present. You know, I'm way more present. Uh, it wasn't that I was never involved in. I want to, you know, not to defend myself. But I, you know, I, I, you know every Saturday or Sunday, I used to take my oldest grocery shopping and we would spend a couple hours just talking and hanging out. You know, I was, I wasn't an absent dad, but I was just not there very much in, in his young years, but I'm even when I am there now, I'm, I'm taking as much time as possible to, to just enjoy it and to just be there. And uh, so far I'm having a blast. Yeah. That's awesome. And that, 
I think that something I, I realized growing up, kind of my dad was, you know, out and about a lot. Mm-hmm. But one thing he always did was he always coached my sports teams. Or he was always, he was involved, even though he was busy and maybe wasn't around as much, he was at least there for those little moments. And that, that's, that's big to be, uh, be able to re- recognize that. Oh, absolutely. Well, my, now my dad, dang, uh, again, I'm, I'm being fair to him. I, I, my, my dad, again, this is uh, the onion that is our lives, right? So I was born with a couple of heart defects and my <laughs> father, uh, so I got to tell the story real quick. So my father switched jobs basically in 1975. And that's what actually how we came to Indiana. Indianapolis uh, was that uh, a former colleague of his had called him up and said, hey, I've got this position for you. You need to come up here. And he's like, hey, I've got a kid that needs a heart surgery. Uh, pre-existing condition kind of insurance in the 1970s, not the same as it is today. And so he said, I, if, you, if, you, if you guys cover this on the insurance and everything, make sure he's covered, then you know, I'll come work for you, basically. So there's a stipulation of him taking this job and moving our family to Indiana. My, my dad made this agreement. And so long story short, here I am. I survived, had the heart surgery. But as a result of that, and I didn't know this until many, many years later as an adult, my father was very distant to me than he was. My, I have two older brothers, four and seven years apart. And you know, he would coach their little league teams, never was involved with mine. They were in Cub Scouts. I was never allowed to be in Cub Scouts. So this is rear, really weird, unspoken, you know, two, you know, sets of rules in the household and the way he enacted and treated around me. Now, he wasn't, he was loving. He was hugger. You know, we, we did stuff but it just, it wasn't equitable in my mind, right? And eventually, years later, he would explain to me as an adult that he had done this because he thought he was going to lose me because I had still other complications for my heart condition. And so he had just distanced himself as a, I mean, as a human, a very human thing to do, you know, to protect himself. And I said, you know, yeah. So I, my dad and I are in a great place, you know, and it, it, it only came to an end really when we were in our, in my teen years was probably the, you know, well, that was, some classic rouse and some, some, you know, words that were said, but so that being said, you know, all that, all that affected how I looked at fatherhood in the sense that, you know, my father in so many ways was this fantastic example of, of what a father is and should be and to me, you know, I was like, yeah, this, this is great. But there was these things I was like, I'll never do that. Right. But boy, careful what you say. Right. And so, yeah. but yeah, well, love the man. And really they do have your best interest. But you just don't know it. You know, you know, it's, it's so true. My oldest, uh, again, not, again, time, time, this whole same theme together. My oldest and I just in the past few years had some amazing conversation where I'll say, Hey, do you remember X, Y, or Z? So one thing I, I suffer from anxiety and depression have for many, many years. And when he was younger, I had a really bad bout. And one of the things that I let get to me was this guilt of just being in that state with a child and, and how that might affect them. Like the unknown, right? But your mind can do some horrible you know, tricks to you. And so I, was, I said, do you remember? You were like, yeah, I don't remember these things. How bad was it for you? Like I, we had these really honest conversations and it was just so fascinating to, such to his character about how, you know, what he didn't remember. Kid, kids are resilient, right? You know, and, and can take some, some amazing things, but some things he did not remember, some things he did and, you know, wrote off. And so, yeah, it just, it was, it was really wonderful having those conversations with him. So I guess my, my point for bringing all this up is there's, you know, things that you may worry about. Oh no, what did I do? You know, how, how badly am I going to suck my kids to put them in therapy or whatnot? Probably not as bad as you think it is. But the cool part is if you can have that kind of relationship, right. To make those connections later when you can talk differently to them, whatever age that might be. I think it's fantastic for everybody involved, you know, to kind of close those loops, which reminds me of the only bit of advice I will pass along to any father, especially young fathers. And that is do not share your worst stories about the yeah, mid thirties is just about the right age to share your dirty. Don't ever share them with your kids. That's what I'm trying to say. Don't, don't share them with your kids and share them with the, the stuff you got up to when you were a kid. But uh, yeah, God, good stuff. Good memories. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, I'd talk. With John Acton, and he uh, was dealing with a cancer, and yeah, he wrote, yeah. He, wrote a, he wrote a book, and his kids they wrote a chapter where they talked about going through it, and that really struck me. He's like, you can always have these conversations with them while we're going through things. Yeah, absolutely, and that can really help them and help you because everyone's scared, especially in a moment like that where you know absolutely. life is on the line, and you know being able to talk about that it just 
it's rewarding and something it, that can always absolutely. be done. Yeah, and it's so cliche, but yeah, I mean, the importance of keeping lines of communication open, right, at all ages. And as much as I, and I am, I am, I joke about teenage kids, right? I mean, teenagers, oh, I, I didn't like being a teenager when I was a teenager. I don't, you know, it was able to be say, look, I, you're going to get mad at me. You're going to hate me. You're going to think I'm the dumbest, uncoolest, whatever person. But please always make time just so we can sit and listen, you know, just talk, talk to each other. Mm hmm doesn't have you know it's not a lecture it would just just keep those lines of communication open that to me was probably the most valuable thing i ever did for him at, at all ages at mm -hmm. all ages being able to say hey look yes you're upset whatever but we're talking we're gonna be able to talk no matter what and that's just been amazing when so yeah i i think talk I, again i did listen to that episode and i think that's a fantastic thing that they did right in that chapter together it's yeah awesome. for sure so you mentioned a little bit about how you came to Indiana for your, mm -hmm. your, your dad and you, you left and came back. What, what is it you like about Indiana and it makes it home? Oh, uh, man. No, that's great. So I, just to be clear, I've, I've moved away. How many times? Like, was it just twice? It feels like, it feels like more. So I moved away, lived in Texas for two years, came back, lived for two years, then moved away for 10 years while I lived in Michigan and then came back. When I've been here ever since. What do I love about India? Pretty much everything. First of all, as a Midwestern, let me start in the, in the broadest sense. As a Midwestern, I love all four seasons. Yeah. I love, I love watching Storm. A, my <laughs> wife and I are both fantastic Storm watchers, Thunderstorm watchers. I love the people. I love the, the, the culture of the Midwest and, of, and I love Indianapolis. I mean, Indianapolis, I've watched, the, the cool thing about <clears throat> being older is that you can actually have a little perspective. And so when I moved to Indianapolis or in the Indianapolis area, uh, and I watched sort of like this renaissance of, you know, the small Midwestern town, you know, so before we had all the uh, museums, right, downtown, before we had the culture walk, before we had, you know, the Circle Center Mall, I, but before Union Station was renovated in the 1980s, I got to see all of that. And I got to see this town evolve and grow and develop and become its own thing, which is so cool to appreciate it. I just, I love what we've done. I actually live out in McCordsville now. And what's kind of cool about that, it's very reminiscent in terms of size. I grew up actually in Mooresville uh, in Morgan County. And, right, you know, it's literally almost opposite poles of, you know, 67. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's some similarities, there. but now, yeah, it's one of the fastest growing communities and mm -hmm. to see the town planning come together, which again, something that a lot of communities don't do or didn't do at all or very well. And so to see a plan come together about how they're going to handle the growth and have these conversations or whatever, again, it's exciting to see, you know, I'm not, I'm not, no offense to anyone, any other, I'm not going to mention any other area, you know, uh, larger areas. I'm not looking for McCorsville to come any other town other than its best version of itself. And as a father, you know, and again, this is something that maybe I wasn't before as, you know, as a younger dad to kind of be more civically minded and to see, you know, Hey, you know, what, you know, if I, if I do put roots in here in this town for the next 10 years, yeah, what's it going to look like in 10 years? And what, am, you know, what should I? I was saying, so I'm a little bit more involved that way in, in looking and listening and talking. So it's interesting to me how the mm -hmm. small towns around Indy kind of have that same feel. They're all, yeah, you know, the, the downtowns are very kind of old and modern, like old looking yeah. brick and, yep. and, but like, it's still you have a group of people that really enjoy the town, really support it. Their little festivals they have and everything yep. that. Yep. It's, it's, it's interesting to see. Cause I grew up in Greenfield that had oh yeah the same kind of feel and yep. everything. It's just, as I go through more of these towns and visiting and just, mm -hmm. and that's kind of Indianapolis itself, even though it's pretty big, it's still a small kind of town feel over. I think you really captured probably more and better what I, I cause I, I did grab a lot about Indianapolis, <laughs> love, but, but actually to be honest with you, it is the small towns that, you know, keep me coming back and what I knew and what I, what I know. And, and I think that's, that's one of the great convenience. <laughs> so I love it saying that, but it's like, you can have small town life and you're in, in, you know, in central Indiana, you're a half hour, an hour away from Indianapolis, which, which, mm -hmm. you know, to me, that that's everything. I mean, I mean, that's everything I want, right? I mean, you know, you've got, you know, fa fantastic infrastructure, you've got social activity shop, whatever, whatever you want, you've got within, you know, as far as central Indiana, but you can also within 30, 40 minutes be in a cornfield or a pond, right? And, you know, or woods and, you know, you're sitting there in the suburbs and, you know, yeah, it's really convenient. 
to yeah. be able to live that life. Yeah. Also, like, you know, being in central Indiana, you're three hours from like five oh, different yeah. states, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You, I mean, you get so many places you can visit just for a day or like a weekend. And that's also. Yeah. To any, any, any person listening to this podcast right now, yes, we are hard selling and, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is. It's one of the, I not, now I will say I compare and contrast living in Texas. Mm -hmm. I lived in, I lived, uh, outside of Austin, Texas and Round Rock and three hours from anywhere. <laughs> I mean, it, it, like we don't, if I don't drive this fast, we're like not even gonna be able to dinner down there and be back. Uh, but yeah, here, yeah. You know, you know, an hour and a half you're out to, you know, Louisville, 45, 50 or Cincinnati, 90 minutes ish to Chicago. Yeah. You're three hours to St. Louis. It's awesome. You know, it really is. Yeah. So I like to end with a fun question. And so we go with who is your favorite TV or movie dad? Oh, um, wow. That's a good question. I will answer with, with, yeah, well, there's a lot, right? There's a lot. Yep. Of I'm, I'm going to pick one and I'll tell you why. Cause it, it wasn't a television dad I grew up with. It was the television dad I needed. There was a TV show on for a number of years called Castle, mm -hmm. uh, starring Nathan Fillion of Firefly uh, and Buffy fame. Yep. And he was, a, he was, he was a mystery writer, but he was a single father, had, had a, had a, had a daughter. That, that's when I was a single dad. When Castle was on, I was a single dad. And to, again, right, to see representation, to see a good dad, you know, he was, he was a fun dad, but he was a serious dad, had a great relationship with his kid. Yeah. So I, for, for whatever weird reason, the time, everything else or whatever, but I really connected with, with that at the time. And, and it was, was really fun about that, but it was because that character, his daughter, Alexis, you know, grew up based on that show and went through those awkward teenage years, much when my son was going through those awkward teenage years, my oldest son, it gave me hope to continue to have that good relationship. And so, yeah. Yeah. Richard Castle. Weird. Yeah. Nathan Phil, you know, <laughs> Yeah. Never thought I'd say as a father figure, but yes, <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah it, it's kind of interesting how, like, if you do watch TV, that it always seems like there's a show out there that just catches you at the right moment. And yeah, as a, as a dad, like for me, it was, this is us. And, you know, they were kind of going through things when, you know, they lose a child and everything. And we had had some miscarriages and like, it was just, it's like those connections and that just happen by happenstance, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm playing on them. You, Obviously, they're not knowing your background making the TV show, but you know it does it does hit that demographic just right sometimes. Yeah, that definitely. And it, it, again, it, it's funny to to sit there. I have to say, you know, you mentioned as a whole conversation with television dads. There's a lot of them out there, and the more the merrier. Like I said, I I, I love seeing uh, the involved dad choices and to see those represented, you know, fairly and accurately. I think that, that's awesome. Yeah, I agree in it. So it's also just a great way to kind of, not, like kind of why I created this you know, podcast so you don't feel like alone because you can feel alone a lot when you're absolutely a dad no. and so like this, absolutely that way you you have a connection with someone on TV here you know we're all in the indie area you you have yep. a connection of someone to listen to and you know connect with that's kind of why the show's here. That's a fantastic way to wrap that 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 my my answer up to you. Thank you. That's a good. That's a <laughs> yeah. great point. All right. Well. I, that was my last question. Do you have anything else you want to impart to us? Uh, yeah, I do. I know this, this is, uh, you know, we all go through rough patches and, and, and this year is probably going to be hard on a lot of people. A lot of people have been laid off time right now. This will pass. Yeah. I guess, uh, you know, saying it could be an old, quote, older dad here. Um, it, it may be a pain in the while, uh, but your kids are going to get through this. You're going to get through this and just stick to being you and being the best dad you can and you'll get through it. That's great. Thank you for that. And thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. It's been, it's been a pleasure. From all of us at Indie Dads, we want to thank John Knight for joining us today. His insight, being a father of two generations and having such a great background to the local culture and how to prioritize family is great for us and knowing that we can always be intentional to prioritize family is just great and great to hear if you would like to be a part of our community you can join us 
on our socials at Indie Dads on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Join us. Join the conversations, what we're all talking about, what we're all getting into. We're trying to be intentional and have our dads be a group of dads that grow together. And that's really what we want. So join us there. If you want to leave us a message or a voicemail or even want to be on our show, you can contact us at IndieDadsPodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. You can tell us jokes. You can We can have fun. We just want you to be a part of this community because a dad's work is never done.